de I delegate without uh, responsibility, without an issue. I mean, think about it. If that was not the case, at the, se at the season of my life when my corporate work became intense, it would have been difficult. It would have had great impact on the business. Because one of the things that's always troubled me about Nigeria is that there are many great Nigerian businesses that have been built over time. But a lot of those businesses have died as the owner died. And as a young woman, as I grew my business, I kept asking myself, if my business dies when I die, I've wasted my life. Because if I've spent all of my youth building, and then it goes down just because my time is up, then I've left no legacy. So I set a target for myself that by the time I'm 50, I would like not to be at the center of driving my business every day. Mm -hmm. So as I became 48, we engaged a firm to sort of consolidate all our companies into the group. And we tried to identify the talents within the company that were able to take the positions that were open and where we needed people from outside to do that so that I could pull back from being at the center mm. of the business. And so essentially, my work in the business is strategy and new businesses, but the everyday running of the business is not mine. I don't like operations even as a person. Mm. I, I probably did it in building the business because I had no choice. But uh, I'm a very restless human being. I can think of the idea. I love the ideation and execution of the idea. But once it becomes a process, I'm bored. You know, I'm on to something else, which is probably why I ended up with multiple mm -hmm. businesses. So the people who really make the business go on are my team mm -hmm. because they are the ones who drive it every day. Mm -hmm. And my only gift to them is to fully empower mm -hmm. them to be able to do what they need to do in order for us to continue whether I'm there or not. Or not. Right. I think it's your responsibility to set your own agenda. It's your responsibility to fight to maintain what you believe and what you consider to be right or wrong. And what you will also find is what people are looking for is value in many ways. And over time, what you need to do is to show them the value that you bring to the table at every opportunity. Now, will you have every opportunity? No. But you see, the opportunities you lose on account of your value system, that's your opportunity cost for what mm -hmm. you believe. And it's a price you must be willing to pay. Now, one thing I can say categorically, there are enough decent Nigerians or, Niger or decent Nigerian institutions that also want to do things right. Otherwise, we would not have survived. Mm. That's really what that points to. Because the only reason we've survived for 30 years and we're still in business is because we found like minds along the path as we sought to deliver value. Now, one of the things we did to compensate for what we will not do is to make sure that we were indispensable to our customers. Mm -hmm. I, I had a saying in the early days that, look, all our customers had to do was encounter us the first time with our dedication to uh, to our business in terms of the quality of product that we sought to deliver to you and with our sincerity in terms of the service that we sought to give and with our diligence in servicing you over time, we always sought partnerships with customers rather than a sale. Because mm. a sale is a one-off, one-time thing. Partnership is a relationship. And when you seek to build relationships, you would find that relationship is a weapon for many of those things. Mm -hmm. When people get to know you and get to know the value you bring to the table for them in terms of products and service and personal interactions, you would find that, yes, there are people that will still make a choice against you mm -hmm. for those things. But there are many decent people who will not. So, I always say that the fact that we've survived this long with our own value system and our practices is simply because there are many more decent Nigerians who do things right than we give ourselves credit for. Mm -hmm. Because we're not selling to ourselves for sure. We're selling to some other people. Mm -hmm. And 
Well, some other people found ways to deal with us as well. If we have what they want based on our product quality and service, they can go to a third party to buy from us on their behalf. So their deal and transaction is with, third, with the third party. It's not with us because they know that that's not something mm -hmm. that we will do. But all in all, we have, you know, the more you stick to something, the more confident you become at it. And the longer you are in a space and delivering value, the longer you cannot be ignored. Mm. Oh, there are many days you want to cry because you know that a transaction, you're better suited for it, you can better deliver value and all of that. But we've learned the patience of waiting for our time within the context of our business. And we have consistently sought to fight for our opportunities with everything that we have. So it's, it's in building for the long term. It's in delivering quality to the customer. It's in consistency of your values. It's in becoming indispensable to your customers in many ways. And you will soon find that there's a place you get to that you sell on your own terms. Well, I mean, furniture is one thing, but manufacturing in general. And if, you, if we talk about furniture, I think sadly we've watched a lot of companies come and go because they've, uh, they haven't been able to survive. But also you've watched uh, a number of incursions into the sector from especially Chinese companies who are coming into the market. Uh, and there's also quite a massive smuggling segment. Because technically, mm -hmm. by the law till today, whole complete furniture importation to Nigeria is actually banned. But I guess all you have to do is drive around either the high streets of Aula Road, VI, or go to markets like Alaba and all of that. And there's furniture everywhere. There's furniture everywhere. You know, so we've had to learn to compete with both legal competition and illegal competition. And what we've always sought to do is to find how to have advantages over those competition, despite their tasking proposition. Because if you are paying duties on everything as you should, and you have a lot of taxation left, right, and center, and you're still dealing with diesel to produce and all sort of power issues, and somebody else is uh, bringing stuff through other means without the cost outlay that you have, they will give you uh, a tough, they will create a tough competitive mm -hmm. environment for you. They do not create the jobs that you create. Because, look, I could import billions of Naira furniture and run the business with five to ten people. Mm -hmm. But there's no way I can produce that without running a factory of hundreds of people and a lot of capital investment in very expensive machinery mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and uh, operational cost. So it's, um, it's a commitment to our country as a firm believer in the fact that there's no way we're going to survive without some level of um, manufacturing activities in our country. There's no way we can create jobs enough if all segments are just reliant on importation mm -hmm. because with that you're creating the jobs in the manufacturing country mm -hmm. and your people are only involved in sales and installation. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, um, you know, there are many days you, you, you have to convince yourself it's not just about you. Mm -hmm. Because there are also days where you think to yourself, look, if I sold all the assets of this company mm -hmm. today and I put my money in the bank and get interest on it, mm -hmm. I would be wealthier than I am leaving the business operating. Mm -hmm. Because you'll have all the money in cash. I'll have no liabilities to carry, no power to look for, no, all of the factors you have to, to, to deal with. You pay your taxes, but you would also be earning decent mm -hmm. um, interest on your capital fund that you put in the bank. But when you think about the hundreds of families whose life is dependent on mm -hmm. your continuous existence in business, hope 
that um, policy decisions will encourage you more and support your ability to deliver that value in an easier form. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the factors. I think we're actually in a much better time than when I started in so many ways. When I started, the banks wouldn't even talk. I remember there was a bank that would not even allow me to open an account with them because we were too small as far as they were concerned. And most of the banks existed to service big companies and businesses. Mm -hmm. But in this time and in this season, you have quite a number of options. You have microfinance banks. You, you have uh, all sort of intervention funds mm -hmm. and grants available for uh, businesses. You, you have uh, a lot of fintech options for short-term money, albeit more expensive. But you know that sometimes people talk about, oh, but it's so expensive. But you know, it's the opportunity cost of having access mm -hmm. to that money. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, I think it was 93 or 94, in a very frustrating moment for me in my business, I, I really needed uh, money to buy some machinery and stuff to move us forward because we had reached a point of frustration mm -hmm. in terms of the business then. But no bank was going to give a business that age. We were four years old then. It was a young lady doing manufacturing. Who was going to give me a major uh, loan for that? It was really a customer of mine who had taken interest in me because he knew that I was diligent and dedicated to my business and that I could deliver value. And I was doing some work for their company and saw that I was sad on that day. I was pregnant, I think, if I remember that point, and just thought, what's wrong with you? You're not your normal self. Follow me to my office. And I sat in front of this gentleman and I told him what was going on. And he said to me, you know what? I can give you a one million naira loan. This was 93. But you need to find a finance house that would broker between us. I would give them the money, you know, and they would issue it to you. And uh, they would be responsible for collecting the money and the interest and everything from you. But they would be responsible for paying me my money. Luckily for me, the only way I had survived in the short term was always to go to a particular finance house to get short-term money, 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days, to execute projects, to buy a machine I desperately needed, you know, and work over that period just to pay back. But I always paid back. Mm. So I had a good track record with them. And when this opportunity came, I went to them and said, look, I have this opportunity. Would you do it? And they said, we'll do it because we know you'll pay. Mm. So they got the one million naira, gave me the one million naira. I worked like a jackass for the next 15 months. Every 90 days, I had to roll over, pay part of our principal, pay interest, roll over, and went on. And, but because of the machines I could buy with the money, I was able to take a major job at that point that by the time I finished the job and they paid us, I could go to the financiers and ask them, what is the final payoff? And it was a season when interest rates were as high as between 40 to 72 percent or something. There was that period in Nigeria where finance house rates were crazy. But I saw it as a short-term high cost for my long-term vision. Mm -hmm. And so I took the money with diligence and dedication, worked the money and the materials and the machines I bought with it to create the value to pay off. And once I paid them off, I owned the machines. Mm -hmm. So I could then use the machines to generate value. Mm -hmm. And that was how I survived. So in a time and a season like this where you have microfinance, albeit, yeah, they're more expensive, but the money is available. Mm -hmm. So what that teaches you is if you take it, you must be disciplined. Mm -hmm. Do what you need to do quickly, return it, but also that the profit from your own business must not be consumed. Mm -hmm. Because the more you retain your business without wasting it in, in lifestyle, is the less of the money from finance house or expensive routes that you will need. Mm -hmm. So that discipline helped me to build internal capital mm -hmm. very quickly because I retain most of our earnings within the business in investing in machines, in building uh, capital for the business, mm -hmm. and in keeping us light in terms of debt. Mm -hmm. So I learned that discipline within a period when it was not even available. Mm -hmm. But right now you've got like Bank of Industry, they have all sort of funds across various categories that are available uh, to young uh, businesses. And even 
if you sort of keep good records and all of that, we're getting into the season where the customer is becoming king, king yeah. because you know all the commercial banks are sort of you know celebrating how to attract the right retail customers or smaller category customers. You know, so it's a good time for small businesses as compared to when when I started. So if if you just make sure that you keep proper records, you're disciplined with your resources, you don't consume all the money. It's not about if you have delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. I don't think I bought my first car for four years after I started a business. And mm -hmm. even then, when I was going to buy, I bought a used car mm -hmm. because that was not my priority. By the time I had, in fact, by the time I bought my first car, which was not a brand new car, mm -hmm. I was already doing 150 million in turnover. Mm -hmm. And so it's not even, mm -hmm. A, a, um, you need to focus on the goal mm -hmm. and give the business what it needs in order mm -hmm. to grow. Well, we all wish in many ways because, you know, I, I think what people also forget is that banks sell what they get. A bank's product is money mm -hmm. and it trades on money. So if you take your money to the bank, and you are asking for interest payment on your deposit of a certain level, mm -hmm. the bank can never give that money out as a loan mm -hmm. to another customer at a level lower than that. It would still have to add on its cost of every branch as generators running, as security provided, as borrow provided. So you, you have all of those other factors mm -hmm. that add to the cost, the cost of doing business, the cost of doing business adds to the cost of financing. Because, we, you know, I sit on both sides now so I can see it better. You, you can easily say, oh, the banks are making it difficult and all that. But in reality, they are running a very expensive shop in terms of uh, all the things that they need to deal with. And by the time you do all that, you're, you're in business to make money. You're not in business to make a loss. So you have to be profitable. And that accounts for some of the... Uh, high cost of funding. But as all the other factors in the economy uh, and infrastructure and all of that are getting better and many other things are at play, mm. then the environment mm. can only, only get better. It's obviously a deliberate policy of uh, mm. the central bank to make sure that uh, the cost of funds mm. is much lower in, in the market and there's uh, throwing out a lot of policies mm. to, to achieve that. And we're a regulated industry, so the banks definitely don't have a choice but to respond mm. the best way that is possible mm. to uh, regulatory directions from the central. I think there's a, there's a lot going on to, um, in terms of getting women onto boards, either by um, deliberate policy decisions regulated or choices made by the, by, by the institutions themselves. But you also have the uh, positive actions by organizations like WIMBYs who are deliberately ensuring that women are equipped and prepared so that they are available. Because part of the issue is always that the companies come back and say we can't find them. So now it's a little hard to say that because there are more than enough qualified women that are around, but you, you know, you might be technically competent, but you might not have some other skills that are required on a board, which is part of why the programs that like uh, WIMBYs that they're running is to fill the gaps so that you will not have that excuse. The women will have what you need. And um, I, I think we are making progress. It could be faster, needs to be faster, because any smart company knows that diversity only adds value to you. You're not going to be looking at the issue from a 180 degree view. You need a 360 degree view to, to look at matters. And except you have uh, men and women together at the table, you never have 360 degree view of anything because we look at things differently. So it's in the interest of institutions to have that diversity on their board to the best that they can. And well, women are building successful businesses now, and so they have uh, control of who sits on their board as well. And so they can influence that in, in many other ways. But all in all, I think we're making progress. We need to speed it up. But I'm very positive that we'll get there. <laughs>